<laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to do a little um, interview and a visit to the uh, planetarium in Juneau, Alaska, the Maria D uh, Drake Planetarium. And um, most of you, I think, know that uh, when I became PPA president, I assigned myself the, the horrible task of <laughs> actually it's wonderful going around and visiting planetariums unfortunately lately it's had to been virtually and I kind of chose going the Juno planetarium thinking I would never actually get there but now I'm, I'm really hoping I do get a chance to sometime so um, yeah the Juno planetarium I think is really exceptional in a whole lot of ways mostly because of the people who operate it and we're going to be talking with them and then um just uh, because of what they do there, um, they, they're all volunteers and all of their shows are free. And they just recently um, made a, a major um, fundraising campaign and uh, installed a digital system, really nice digital system, which we, they've barely gotten to use so far, I guess. But anyway, um, I thought it'd be uh, really interesting for people to uh, go on a virtual visit here and, and talk with these people. So uh, I think I wanted to just start out by, um, it sounds like they've got things pretty well in order as uh, I mentioned a few of the questions I was gonna have for them. So I think um, the first thing though is, uh, hopefully you guys had a chance to maybe see my um, president <laughs> report in the Great Western Observer. Yes. If you did, um, how accurate was I? Did I make any major mistakes? Would you like Flattery to will get you everywhere with me. <laughs> I, I was. Yeah, is there any, any changes? Anybody want to elaborate on anything that they noticed there? Anything? Very nice. Thank you. Oh. And pass inspection. <laughs> Great. Four oh. Well, I guess uh, to, I'm, I'm going to have some questions here to throw out if there's like a little or we need to, you know, kind of get started or whatever on a topic. But uh, let's start by the, the history of the planetarium. And I know you guys have some, some things arranged for that. So Rosemary. Oh, I should introduce you. Uh, Rosemary Walling as the... Um, PPA member and the one I've been mostly in contact with uh, when I was doing my virtual um, interview with them. And then uh, C Steve uh, Coxus is the uh, secretary of the- Namaste. <laughs> of the uh, board of directors. And the president of the board of directors is Christina Del De La Rosa. And uh, I guess it will be just the three of you guys uh, today. Okay, there are a couple of other board members. Um, Unfortunately, they couldn't make it, but um, I'm sure that- uh, Yeah, two other board members, David Hansen and Clark Branch. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, mentioning their names, yeah. Um, and I know Clark uh, had was unable to, to make it. He had sent a message, and then I guess David uh, was unable to at the last minute there, so unfortunately. Anyway, uh, go ahead, Rosemary. It sounds like you're pretty well set up to talk a little bit about the history. Um. So we, we wanted to give a lot of pictures. So we put them in slides, but just um, speak up anytime. And so let me try successfully to do that. So do you want, uh, do you want Steve to do this or what? Uh, no, I'm going to do it again. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, do you want the talk? Yeah. Uh, no, I've got the talk. I think I just closed it, but I'm going to open it again. Steve is here. Do not fear. Um. Well, I don't think I mentioned that the uh, Maria Drake Planetarium is the oldest planetarium in Alaska. And yeah, we have the second largest dome at 30 feet. Uh, oh, okay. And Juno's in a rainforest, so we get 60 to 100 inches of precip a year. And huh? we're at 58 degrees latitude, so right now sunsets at 3.05 p.m. Wow. Uh, and we don't really get that cold. We're on the Pacific Ocean. Ocean's a big heat sink. Oh, carry on. All right. Thanks, Rosemary. So that's showing? Yes, thank you. Okay. I see it's the logo. <laughs> nice logo. So we've had a logo um, for quite a long time, and um, it's got kind of that ancient planetarium tinge to it, which, mm -hmm. which is pretty appropriate. Uh, so we are a nonprofit um, 
and we have uh, been run by volunteers for 30 years. Um, we do programs for uh, the public, for school classes and the community groups. And uh, it's diverse programming because we're all volunteers. So it's pretty much been, we only do what we're interested in and there's enough variety of that, um, that, that that's worked. Uh, so this is us, this is the picture we put together for the, um, the Great Western Observer um, with our names and Clark Branch and David Hansen are the two people who won't um, join us today. But, uh, you know, the fish is kind of an honorary member. <laughs> Gino is a very outdoors place and um, that's just part of the culture. So um, we took some of the questions that um, Carl had sent us and we put some things together. I'll talk a little bit about Gino because if you don't understand a little bit how Gino is different, you won't really get what our planetarium is about. Okay. And then uh, Christina and Steve will go into the history and a little bit of the fundraising. I'll talk about what we did in 2019 and that also brings in sort of um, an approach to fundraising that I used during that. And then a little bit about 2020, but um, just interrupt any time. So, um, do you know? So Alaska's big. I don't know what projection this is, so it may be actually not equal area. <laughs> I, I think Alaska is really about a third, maybe of sort of the the continental part, the lower part. But Juno's right in here. It's Panhandle. Uh, can you see my arrow? I yes. can. Yes. Okay. So we are not the typical Alaska, and we're north of Seattle. So we're like a colder version and wetter version of Seattle and a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how I, and we think of Seattle as our sister city because if you need to fly out uh, of Juneau, at least not in the local area, you have to go through Seattle or you have to go through Anchorage. So everybody in Juneau goes through Seattle pretty much to go um, down south. And um, this is a piece of the panhandle. This is the panhandle, the lower part. Um, we're surrounded by national forests. The Tongass is maybe the largest contiguous temperate rainforest. I'm not sure, it's got some title like that. It's really huge. And Juno is right in the middle of it here. Um, so we've got, you know, hiking, wildlife, all of that good stuff. Uh, a lot of tourists come to see Glacier Bay National Park. A lot of tourists come to Juno by cruise ships. So in this past year, we've had zero cruise ships. So the, the you know, the economy in Juno is not great. It started out not great when the price of oil dropped and the Alaska um, economy dropped. Uh, and then when COVID hit and it's not been a particularly good fishing season, uh, it's really kind of hard on people. Well, Rosemary, uh, is, is, is it okay if I interrupt? Sure. Yeah, uh, the in interesting thing about Juno is we're inside passage. So like this last Monday when it was new moon, we had a 25 foot tide. We had a minus four and a 20 foot uh, high tide. So I'm a kayaker, so it's a world-class kayaking here. And there's like hundreds of islands between us and open ocean. Notice we're not at the open ocean. So that's why we get the big tides. It's like hydraulics and many of the islands have these public huts that you can reserve so you can kayak from hut to hut. I, I, I just wanted to mention that because that's one of my activities is kayaking. Sorry, Rosemary. No, that's fine. I mean, that's kind of the, the flavor up here. And, you know, there's water on one side and there's mountains and an ice field on the other. This is, you know, down here. Uh -huh. uh, we have our own local glacier here, excuse me, um, the Mendenhall Glacier. But um, um, Rosemary, you, maybe you can point out my house on the map there. <laughs> uh, so they live about here. Ooh. Ah. In, in, a, in a place called the Valley, the road system, I don't know, maybe it's 40 miles. Steve probably knows the number. But from north, to, it runs north to south. And because of the terrain and other things, um, you know, the houses are very sparse as you go north. This is a big area here, the valley. 
near the Mendenhall Glacier. That's where Steve lives. I'm in this little nook right there, about 18 miles from downtown. And then this is downtown. And there's also like the People's Republic of Douglas, which is kind of where it has its own little culture. They have their own uh, 4th of July. Can I interrupt again? Yes, you Sorry. can interrupt. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a skier. So I was skiing by the glacier today and I'm getting ready for a ski race tomorrow, Nordic. And we have a downhill as Rosemary was saying, Douglas Island, there's one bridge to Douglas Island and there's a downhill skiing there, Eagle Crest. Um, yeah. And they're, they're about to open. We just had some warm weather. So some of the snow base melted off, but they'll be opening up in the next two weeks. Sorry, Rosemary. So so we get a lot of rain. Um, we get a lot of snow some winters because we're kind of on that boundary between snow. Right now we have a lot of snow on the ground and it's turning to rain. Uh, but this is a picture of downtown Juneau. And so I want to emphasize that we're different because this is all there is. We don't, we can't drive to Berkeley or LA or Seattle to go to cultural events. Um, uh, this is the only planetarium in the area. And um, we, even if you're like me, I'm 18 miles from downtown and I tend not to drive to all these cultural events, but I'm really, really happy that, that there's enough people, that I live in a place where people care about such things. So local things like local theater, local symphony, the local planetarium are really wonderful community. Uh, endeavors that we have. And that's, I think that's one reason why we really try to keep it, keep it um, free. Um, some people, you know, $5, they really need the $5 to buy food. And if we take that model where if you offer something, you should ask people to pay for it. Um, it's not a model that we've ever accepted here, even if we were to charge like $2 or something. Did you mention the population of the area? Oh, it's about 33,000. Wow. And we also have a pretty strong native Alaska culture that's ingrained in the area as well. Um, and this is a picture by one of our local photographers. So Juno can be really beautiful. If you're a night sky photographer, you can take really wonderful pictures. This is one of the Aurora. And this is looking from Douglas Island. So you see downtown Juno right here. Uh, so that's kind of snapshot of Juno and why we think the planetarium in Juno is kind of special. Um, you know, it's all there is here. You have to go by ferry or by Alaska Airlines if you want to get to someplace else, or you can do it virtually. And there's a lot of good resources online. I'm not knocking that. So I'll let. Um, Steve and Christina take over now and talk a little bit about stuff up to 2020. And does anybody have any questions about Juno? Okay, go ahead, Steve. Okay, as far as history goes, let me just mention something that typically we get a million plus cruise ship passengers coming from May to September, but <laughs> this summer we had zero. So it made a big difference as far as visiting at the glacier, not having the cruise ship passengers. So 1967, the Spitz A3P was put in and that's during the Sputnik era. And there was money for that. In fact, there was quite a few planetariums that I know Medford, Oregon also got a Spitz A3P about the same time because I was a senior at the Medford High School. We moved from New Jersey when I was 16 and I worked at the planetarium in Medford, which was a Spitz A3P. And then in 98, I moved to Juneau and ended up as a volunteer at the planetarium here in Juneau. So initially, Juneau had a full-time equivalent teacher for the planetarium. And that budget ran out, oh, I believe It just went 70s. for a few years. <laughs> Pardon me? It only went for a few years. The budget yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, the budget didn't last that long. And what happened is basically the planetarium ended up as a closet for storage. They took out the permanent seats and they were storing things there and it was probably just going to be dismantled. But in the early 90s, uh, a group of volunteers started using the spits again. And as Rosemary said, the shows were free and they were all put on by volunteers. 
And we've been pretty much doing shows continuously then uh, for about 30 years. And Juno is kind of interesting. Most uh, of the jobs are government jobs, city, state, and federal. And the other jobs are both fisheries and tourism related. So there is actually a pretty high educational level here in Juneau because of the government jobs. And everyone who volunteers at the planetarium and does lectures you just follow their own interests. My background's in mathematics, so I'm more interested in cosmology, not cosmetology, but cosmology. So I usually like doing shows on the Big Bang and black holes and uh, more exotic areas uh, for the planetarium. So our big news, our really big news is we formed a nonprofit, I believe it was in about 2012, a 501c3. And we had always talked about fundraising to get a digital projector to go from analog to digital. And last year, the fundraising just accelerated. So uh, oh, that's right. we'll cover that. Oh, she will. Okay. So I won't cover fundraising. So well, anyway, um, more history. Well, basically, you know, we, we do shows uh, and also we have a 4th of July parade. This is a photo of our group for a 4th of July parade. I love that yeah. picture. So <laughs> these, great. these are some of the subjects that have been popular over the years, but basically we never know what will tickle the audience fancy. And also it just depends on what else is going on that day. Um, but so, one, of our, one of our volunteers, uh, Michael Orlock, did a, had got a good attendance at the, at the July 4th parade. So I'd like to just um, say something that hasn't been said so far that I, I'm a relatively new volunteer and maybe within the last five or 10 years, I can't count. But um, people like Michael Orlov was sort of a Juno personality and he and some others, uh, Steve has been working on it for a long time, really carried through having the planetarium give 12 shows a year, minimum once a month uh, for a long period of time. And um, if it weren't for those volunteers doing whatever they wanted to do, then the planetarium probably wouldn't still be a facility now that we could upgrade and put the digital projector in. So I just want to give thanks because there was this period there where it really exists now because of a group of people that I was not part of who just kind of did interesting things and had fun. And a lot of kids, a lot of kid stuff is what they did. Um, someone was asking about the analog projector. We don't know what we're gonna do with it yet. We may keep it. We may pay some money to get a little bit of improvements on its optics. Maybe we'll put it in a local location, but it hasn't been determined yet what we're gonna do with it. I, I will say that once I was cleaning the closet, and the Spitz A3P comes with all of these other devices, like there's an Aurora piece, there's the planets, there's all of these stuff. Um, we haven't had those on for, I don't know how long. Some of them may not never have been used, they're pristine. So even though the Starball itself may have a dent in it, uh, it's been used heavily. Um, the, the parts that come with it are really in really excellent condition. So like Christina was saying, it's, it's a discussion among the board now as to whether we want to um, pull the spits out, put our new projector in there, um, try to find a nice location for it, perhaps at a museum if somebody would take it. Um, so those are just options we're looking into. So let me just go back to, um, if I, I'm gonna, sorry, I don't know how to do this more so than just speed through it again. Yeah, okay. I just joined the Facebook group about his, uh, that was just made about histories, planetarium history. Yeah. And then the lady said there was one with IPS as well. So the Spitz has a piece of history with Juno because there'll be people who come to the planetarium shows now and talk about how amazed they were coming there as a kid because they grew up maybe when the Juno School District was still having shows there, or they came to one of the public shows when they were small. So it's, it's not something that we're just going to take out 
um, right away. We want to give some thought to what we do. So uh, go ahead, Steve, if you want to talk about some of the planet walks. Yeah, we have a series of lakes, uh, twin lakes, and we installed a scaled planet walk. And in fact, uh, on the left hand side here is the artist's rendering of the uh, of the sun. This is the limb of the sun with the coronal mass ejection going on. And we, we then had the planets, including Pluto at the time. It, when we put this in, we, we didn't have the, the uh, Pluto being categorized as a dwarf planet uh, at the time. So yeah, we then had all the planets painted by uh, artist group uh, along this sort of mile long section along Twin Lakes, which is right along the Pacific Ocean here in Juneau. And that's Michael Orlov, um, who's one of the first volunteers. And here we, here's the, uh, well, just before Pluto. So we started out, we started out with a planet walk with just um, painted signs with the planets. Then when that all kind of got washed away with the rain, we had someone do another set of drawings, but they have all kind of disappeared. So right now we, it's kind of not really marked out very well, but we have the, the permission to use the property. So once some a volunteer shows an interest, they could get it revamped and we could spend, you know, a certain amount of money to put up some very simple, maybe signs that are not on the ground, but actually stick out of the ground. But that's a project for someone to step forward with. And, and somebody asked if it could be a permanent installation. We've got a really good um, relationship with the city. Um, yeah. Last when I ran into somebody, um, I forget why I was, oh, I needed to borrow one of those things to measure up distances from the city. And he was immediately talking about Planet Walk. So uh, getting a permanent installation, um, that's something we could do and um, put some money into getting some nice signs, maybe with some audio so that when people stop, you know, they put their phone there and get a nice message about what they're looking at. So that's definitely something that we could do in the future. And, and with COVID going on, it's kind of a shame that we haven't done it now because it's one of the few things <laughs> <laughs> you know, that people could really get into. Um, but I think I'm just going to interject here and say that um, after a busy year in 2019, I've kind of scaled back efforts. And so I'm just starting to think about ramping up again and getting more active. So let's, um, this was something else. Steve, you can talk about this. Michael Orlov used to have these projects. Yeah, this was a project by the cruise ship docks, and it's a sundial. And we're showing the two arcs of the sundial. We haven't put in the disk for the shadow at this point. And this sundial, because of changes on the dock, is no longer there. In the same area, we also put up a tidal gauge to show the changes in the tide that was right by the sundial. And we also had a map of the U.S. made out of nails. And um, one thing that Michael was really good at was getting different community groups to just do one dot. I mean, it was really just to make them feel part of it. Um, so that was successful. So these are some um, shows mostly before we started with um, a big serious fundraising, just to give a little more history of the planetarium. So I can talk about that. We've had um, yoga under the stars and music under the stars just lying on the ground listening to fun music on Valentine's Day. And we had a lecture by our, our previous director of the symphony talking about the Hulse, the planet. And we had a sort of a very low budget film. It really wasn't very educational. It was just was fun called Space Trucker Bruce by a local filmmaker. And then we had someone from the Alaska State Museum talk about our, our moon rock that belonged to Alaska that was actually stolen. And then how it came back to be back in the possession of the uh, Alaska State Museum. Oh, uh, Christina, I'd like to amplify that story about the Alaska moon rock. Uh um, what happened is where it was being displayed, it was being displayed in Anchorage. I, I believe that each state received a moon rock to display from what was collected. And um, there was a fire and the building where the moon rock was being displayed in Anchorage. I believe, I think this was like 
20 years ago or 25 years ago. And during the fire, the moon rock went missing. And then there was no word about the moon rock for about 15 years. And then it showed up for sale on eBay, this moon rock. And it turned out that the person who was connected with selling it was this reality TV show uh, that was about the Alaska fisheries. Um, I never watched it. I think it had a, a uh, fishing vessel with the whole name Time Bandit. I've never watched the show. I even forget the name of the show. But anyway, it was illegal to sell this moon rock. And so the authorities were able to obtain the moon rock from the um, man who was connected with the Time Bandit fishing vessel. I don't know if anyone knows what that show was called. Um, it was about fishing in the Bering Sea, actually. Uh, well, anyway, it was recovered, and now it's on display in the State Museum in Juneau, Alaska, the uh, state of Alaska Moon Rock. Somebody uh, said Deadliest Catch. That Deadliest Catch, yeah, that was the yeah. show. I've never watched it, so. Okay. You know, if you're a real Juneau or Alaskan person, you probably don't watch these shows about Alaska, but that's probably goes for most places. Um, then we had a volunteer, Ken Fix, who was very interested in mythology. He had volunteered at his hometown at, uh, what was that place he volunteered, Steve? Oh, uh, yeah, in, I believe it's in, it's Nash in Memphis, No, it's, it's, it's Nashville. It's, they have oh, Nashville, a, sorry. they have a, I think it's almost a full-scale model of the Pantheon in Centennial Park. I know because I'm from the area. Anyway, Ken would talk about the planet and show some uh, pictures relating to that. And then he'd talk about the, the God and the, some of the mythology that related to that. Um, so that was an interesting series that he did, that we did. Um, then I guess something else unusual is that I do, I do shows about astronomy humor because I don't know enough about astronomy scientifically. And we've done ones on astronomy humor, astronaut humor. Steve and I did together the moon facts and follies. So it alternates something true with something just kind of silly. Um, I did the humor related to the um, Earth Day, which was not, which is one of our, my least successful events and uh, um, other humorous topics. And I'm right now I'm working on uh, Santa goes to space. And I also have one on the solar eclipse humor. I have a, 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 a show on that. Hmm. And then Steve, um, he likes to talk about things that are more cerebral and we actually have had a good audience for that. Well, I think it's always true that people are attracted to the exotic astronomical objects, especially black holes. I mean, I, I believe even Neil deGrasse Tyson in his star talk says that that's like the most popular subject that he has because uh, they're, they're, they're so uh, they're so strange basically so we always would get a good turnout for talks on cosmology uh, one thing i'd mentioned about that it's kind of a challenge to talk about the big bang and explain it all in 40 minutes i mean and or something like the black hole you could talk about it for 40 minutes and you may not, it, it's just a hard concept to understand. So people might not even understand after 40 minutes, but we try to, the team tries the best it can to explain these complex ideas and uh, people have been very receptive to it. And we usually always have a couple of kids who, who are sort of in their, maybe just before teenage years and who are very um, responsive, usually have some very intelligent questions about these um, difficult challenges. Oh, uh, I just heard, in fact, talking about black holes, I just heard something on NPR this morning that I believe Disney made a film, Black Hole, back in the, I think it was in the 70s. And the NPR story said they're making, that Disney's making a new film, uh, Black Hole now, so. The question in the chat, somebody wants to hear more about space trucker Bruce? Oh, I'll, I'll put a link. Um, I'll just, I can put a link to it later. It's, or you can just, it's, you can actually buy it on Amazon. Yeah, I think he's selling it for $5. And he was working on a another movie. I don't know if he ever, ever finished that. But yeah, I think it's available on Amazon, that space trucker Bruce. So I've learned something new today. Oh, I, I, I have a quick Bruce. question to the group. I mentioned that 
film from the seventies, Black Hole. I never saw it. Was does anyone know if it was any good or it was terrible? I, I, it was okay. I didn't know. It was terrible. Okay. Maybe this one. The, tra better. the trailer for it was wonderful. The movie was terrible. Okay. <laughs> there, there was a planetarium show distributed free that was produced in Denver that Disney paid for to be distributed to planetariums. Oh. Uh, the planetarium show was actually good. I okay. Mean, it was slides. It was narrated by Leonard Nimoy, and uh, we ran it in Nebraska. And I know other people ran it, so it it was a good show. It was just kind of like, well, go watch this show. Don't go watch the movie. I uh, wait. I have a quick thing to say about movies on astronomy. The the film um, Interstellar had the astrophysicist Kip Thorne as an advisor, and I thought the science in that. Film film was um, well done. Was it Matthew McConaughey was in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was so we could we could talk about shows all day, but I guess we'll talk. Rosemary's going to talk about um, some of our fundraising efforts. That's uh, exciting. So Christine, I'm, I'm going to let you go through your slides, and then I'll go into detail about 2019. Okay. Well. Um, we became, we got our official IRS designation in 2014. It takes quite a few years to do a couple of years just for them to process it. But we did that just to become, so we could apply for grants. And um, we had been fundraising for the planetarium and we got individual donations. And I was kind of hoping that we'd get, be like the Bernie Sanders campaign for president, that there'd be all these people sending in very small donations. But it really didn't work out that well. Of course, we appreciate all donations of any amount, but it still doesn't really get you a digital planetarium projector. So we ended up going to a, the Rasmussen Foundation, which only funds um, uh, things in Alaska. It does not fund schools, but even though we are located in a school, we the actual planetarium nonprofit is not a school and since we're the ones buying the projector and owning the projector we qualified for that so we got what they call a tier one grant which is twenty five thousand dollars and there's a local group called the juno community foundation which helps you to answer your questions about applying for the Rasmussen. so that was a big grant and they the juno community foundation also if uh, someone dies and they maybe want to leave some money they, instead of forming that whole whole nonprofit, they can just have the, their money administered by the Bruno Juno Community Foundation. And then Mr. Blackwell, Mike Blackwell, he um, he had left some, has left money and he, we got uh, $10,000 from him. And the way that came about is that we, the lady who gave a talk on the geology of the moon knew, knew Mr. Blackwell's son, Matt, who works at the Morrison Planetarium. And then we got in touch with him and then we applied for the, the money and then we got that grant. I will say that um, when I met with Matt Blackwell, um, he was interested in supporting us, but he also wanted to see the spits. So he got a private 30 minute or so tour of the spits. So oh. for people who work in like one of the most modern planetariums, there's still an interest um, in the uh, early machines like the Spitz. And the after that, uh, or about the same time actually, we went to an event called Gold Rush Days and it celebrates the mining and logging that we have in Alaska. It's a community event and it's sponsored by the mining company Kensington Mine Core Alaska. So at the event, we just talked to everybody and um, one person we talked to happened to be one of the representatives from Core Alaska. So we talked to her about getting some funding. We talked to another mining company and that ended up with a $25,000 grant. So the, the moral is always be nice to everybody because in Juno, mm -hmm. everyone's connected, but also you never know, someone you talk to might know somebody else and it all comes around in a good way. I mean, I try to be nice to everyone anyway, but it all does does come together. And if we hadn't gone to this event, we just had a very simple display. We didn't do anything profound. It was too rainy, so we couldn't even do a look at the through a telescope. But if we hadn't been at that event, we would never have that money um, and we'd never be where we are today. So. Oh, Christina, I just like to mention that other than 
government, uh, Kennington Mine is probably the largest employer in Juneau. I think there's about 300 right. plus workers there. And this is an, an, a picture uh, that the newspaper took. Um, they've been supporting and supportive of writing articles about us. And because we're pretty small, if we write a letter to the, if we write an article for the newspaper, they'll probably put it in. They've also come and interviewed us and been to shows. <laughs> so this is Rosemary with our new projector. And um, they did a really nice article about um, what we might have, what about why it would be why it could be really cool if we could get funding to get our own projection. It's a great picture, of Rosemary. I like that. So this is a picture, of course, taken by a professional photographer for the newspaper, and it's a picture of um, the Museum of Flight's portable. Right. That, that's what I meant to say. So we, they were uh, and I'll talk more about that. Yeah. They were showing this to show what we could do if we got our own projector, which would look a bit different. You're absolutely right, Rosemary. What does this mean? Hybrid for the win. I don't know what that means. Oh, a hybrid system has both a star projector and digital projector. Oh. And it's the best of both worlds, in my opinion. Yeah. So someone was asking if, this, if the building, this room is still used for the school. Yes, it's a shared space, so we always have to put everything away. They don't do much with it. They use it for um, just meetings or the kids meet there for rally and, and play games. It's not really used that much, but because it's sometimes used, we can't, we have to keep our stuff out every time we have a show, which is a bit of a nuisance. But it is a shared space and it does belong to the school. So it's um, their prerogative, of course. So there was a time when the planetarium room was actually used also for like a computer lab back in the early days of computer lab and so forth. Right now, it, before COVID, it was primarily a place where kids who had to wait for their buses to get here mm -hmm. uh, we would go with, um, you know, Juno personnel to like, keep them busy. And so, I put this um, in this slide in to show that we've been on the radio a lot, both the public radio, K2, and the private radio station. And, and done capital chat and Juno afternoon. So that's been publicity. Um, Steve's gonna go there next week and talk about um, the solstice and the conjunction. So that gives us publicity and maybe it doesn't directly lead to money, but it creates awareness of us in the community. Okay. Oh, Christina, I just wanna interject. Uh, so when we have done shows in the planetarium, we've sometimes had up to 80 people, that's pretty crowded when we have 80 people. Uh, normally we'd like to keep it to about 60 at a max. Uh, we'll have to see uh, post COVID uh, about uh, social spacing. So in the past, we never, before 2019, we never, um, except if we had a visitor coming to town to do something special, we never had um, people sign up. It was just come, first come. And we would always try to fit people in. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk more specifically about what we did in 2019 um, for the fundraising and then the planetarium purchase of the projector. So one thing is um, just try to get the word out that the planetarium exists. It's active. We started having more shows. We started having kids shows again, which we hadn't done for a while because the volunteers that we had were more interested in adult things after Michael Orlov and John Kramer left. Um, so there was an effort and I usually did the kids shows. I even tried to give a talk on telescopes to kids. I'm not sure how successful that was. But anyway, most of the times it's things like making an activity. Um, but you know, the thing is, even if most of our attendance came from an email distribution that we had, and we also made a point of trying to build it up, we didn't do mailing lists. Uh, we didn't try to collect phone numbers. We just wanted emails and um, people to sign up for Facebook uh, if they wanted to. That was another way, but it was really important just to plaster around town uh, events, even if maybe we only got five or, you know, half a dozen people who actually came because they saw one. We did get new people and some of those new people turned out to be pretty valuable. So um, it was pretty important just to get the word out. And so we had some of the typical kind of shows, Orion, this one over here is on Mars. But the big thing was, um, 
getting that com first community grant, which in this case was a state grant from the Rasmussen Foundation, that showed that we were really serious. Uh, before we got our money, just by putting a bucket out, and sometimes we even forgot to ask people to put money in the bucket on the way out. But so we maybe we had a thousand dollars or so. I'm not sure. We didn't have a lot of money before we started the serious um, grant, but we really didn't have a lot of expenses except for occasional supplies. Um, so this was twenty-five thousand dollars, and and that showed that we were serious organization. Uh, people took us seriously and we could start to work off of that. Um, I, and so at that time we, Digitalis is the company that worked with and they were about to discontinue a model that we were interested in. So once we had enough money, we um, arranged to buy from them um, what was called the Kappa One, and it could be either fixed or portable. Just, uh, I think we were gonna go for the portable, that may be what we ordered since we're in a shared facility. Um, but so we put in the order because we had to do that by the end of March, some deadline. And so we did that and we were accepted, but then the barcode company that makes the projectors could not deliver on that projector. And this was part of an effort not to get away from the old high intensity bulbs um, that have mercury. So, you know, we made a good faith, faith effort to purchase, but, um, and Digitalis did as well, but then the Barco um, projector company couldn't supply. So Digitalis really worked with us to enable us to do a stepwise process where we could eventually build up to a full Lambda system. Mm. And so, um, I just have to give a shout out to Digitalis um, because they were able to work with a group as small as us to come up with a way that we could actually um, get a digital projector. Yeah, and I want to get Digitalis, even, you can even lease the system, but of course it costs you more money in the long run. I also want to give Rosemary credit for really doing the research for the different companies that offer these different systems because it's you have to know what you want to actually buy and how much it's going to be. And she really did that technical, you know, analysis of what would be good, a good system, but good a good enough within our budget, of course. And uh, Carrie, who you all know, a digitalist, worked, you know, just tirelessly answering all my email questions. Question from the chat. Uh, how many people can can you have at one time in pre-COVID? Well, we could probably squeeze in about 80, but, um, you know, 80 people if we wanted, but usually we'd have more like 50 or 60 people. Yeah, 60 was comfortable. Yeah. Um, 40 is even more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. but we were planning. <laughs> yeah, I agree. We were planning with once we have any projector we're hoping to have maybe 40 people plus the volunteers in the room so that everyone could be in a circle and get a really good view we didn't want people to be having this wonderful projector but to be way in the back and not really being able to see the dome so we were looking at 40 people plus the uh, people running the projector to make a, um, a a really nice viewing experience for people let me just mention that the permanent chairs were taken out of the planetarium when it was used as a storage space. And so we have to set up chairs every time we do a show and then put them away again. So that does take up time for our events. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when we have kids, they just lay on the ground. So if yeah, they no kids. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of flex, it's kind of nice having the flexibility to allow a lot of space for kids or have chairs that adults can sit in. Um, at some point, maybe we can try to figure out how to get some chairs that are more comfortable. Um, but I think at this point, we're not really interested in having permanently mounted chairs, even if the school district would want, would allow us to do that. We do have to coordinate these things because it's not our facility. So I, I talked just a little bit about fundraising because when we started this, I read books, I watched webinars online, and I went to one workshop on fundraising that 
was given at the public library. And the main thing I learned in all of this was the answer to one question, and that is, why do people give money? And people, when asked that question, people had all sorts of different answers. And my answer was, well, it's a good cause. And that actually turns out not to be enough. The real answer to that question is because it makes them feel good. And, and so you really have to listen to people. You have to understand how they can benefit or um, feel good about any benefit that they get by giving money. So it's really about the fact that um, it makes it feel makes people feel good when they give money, and um, so the first this ties into the fact that we wanted to continue to advertise the planetarium as a community resource, and so again we just did a lot of events in 2019. Uh, we did some things with the public library because then they have their own distribution of advertising. We did some stuff for the moon landing. And we try to give some ideas as to, you know, how far along we were on the fundraising. So again, the nice thing about working with some of these organizations is they'll put together the flyers. You just give them a little material. And we had a um, portable planetarium, an old, um, um, sure. forget, yeah. What do you call it? What was the company? Star Lab. Star Lab. Yeah. Uh, uh, that. Sitka, another community in Southeast, had two of, and so they lent us one. So, that you know, was, yeah, that was through the Girl Scouts. So, we have access to it. We don't own it, but we have access to it. And we can also put it up at the, um, we put it up in the state um, uh, museum as well. And the, planet, the portable planetarium, even though it's very simple, the kids really like it. And, they, and the parents just in, really enjoy having the opportunity to take their children to that. So, um, so the point is make them happy, make people happy. And this was in the public library. Uh, this was what we did for the Apollo 11. Um, you know, maybe there were, I don't know how many people, maybe 60 people came to the movie. Yeah, um, we didn't make that much money, but you know, the people who went to the movie really enjoyed it. And, um, and um, it was just good PR and it is a good movie. So. Well, actually, after we paid for the rental, we, we ended up making about $600. Yeah. But that's not very much money no, when you need to raise no. 80000 for a projector. Right, true. It's all, it all depends on whether the glass is half full or half empty. Yeah. So again, we we got a lot of good publicity out of it yeah, and showed that, that we were working with the Gold Town Nickelodeon Theater. We showed that we were part of a community effort once more. And, and we did. Were, and there were other shows, events relating to Apollo um, 11. The library put some on and uh, the State Museum put on about the moon geology and we put on some events relating to the Apollo 11 anniversary. So the next big thing that happened was in the summer um, that Blackwell was in Juneau and we got to, I got to meet with him and talk to him about the planetarium through a common friend of ours and um, and he wanted to give ten thousand dollar matching grant to his father's foundation. So uh, this this happened right at a very important time because we were building up to a big planetarium week um, that we call Digital Planetarium Week. And we could not have done this without the Museum of Flight. And I don't know, Steve, if you just want to give like a one minute version of how this came about. Yeah, this was an example of serendipity. In um, 2017, we were at Warm Springs Indian Reservation for the total solar eclipse, and the Museum of Flight people were there also. And so we started talking with them. And as Rosemary just said, uh, they came to Juno with the Kappa system and used it for the Digital Planetarium Week. And that really accelerated our fundraising when people saw what the capabilities oh. were. So what happened with the Museum of Flight is they're in Seattle and their museum um, has a section on a, um, space flight and they have a grant to go out to other communities and that includes ones out of state. So they paid for almost everything for the three people to come and visit us for, for five days and the school district contributed a little bit and um, we contributed a little bit, but it was mainly their 
grant themselves. And so um, carry on, Rosemary. So initially, when I heard that Museum of Flight people were interested in coming up, and this was a few years, some years ago, it was back at the eclipse, um, and then it might be free, I was skeptical. But when I finally called uh, a few years later, um, they paid for flight and the people's salary for about a week of time while they were here through a grant that they have that works for um, the Northwest area of the country. I don't know what's happened since COVID, but before that, there was a possibility. I mean, if you were in that area, you could call and talk to and talk to them about it. Uh, the school district kicked in the lodging and per diem, and we kicked in for the transportation, renting a van. And um, we just did a whole week getting as much publicity out of it as we could. We focused on um, uh, on sort of early, like, I forget which grades it was now, but it's late uh, elementary school, I think is yeah, the one. I think it was up to fifth grade. Yeah, so it was third, fourth and fifth grade. And we just right. about got every public school, um, third, fourth and fifth grader through right. the planetarium, either in their school with the Museum of Flights portable or in the planetarium itself, which could have more people. Um, and that had, um, they set up their portable on top of the spits table for that. And it worked really well. So, um, you know, we just kept it busy. Uh, I, I seem to have knocked out the flyer that we used that <laughs> advertised. We had the Big Bird movie. We had um, some of the digital movies. We had uh, Under in the Night Sky, which is their um, night live interactive program. And um, we just kind of divided up into some stuff that were aimed at kids and some stuff that was all audience, but people could come to whatever they wanted. And this was the first time we had to have any kind of sign up. I looked at brown paper tickets, but it was really complicated to keep it free. And so we used something called Sign Up Genius, which worked pretty well. We could have people sign up so that not too many people came for the shows and yet still have it free. Um, with Sign Up Genius, there's a way to have them give donations if you want. But I didn't like the way the message came across because what I really wanted was people to come, not to see that they could give money, get them to come, and then they'll give money. And that seemed to work pretty well. Um, and I was so proud of this, I had to take a picture. We finally got a new sign to go outside the building. <laughs> the other one was torn and tattered, and we got it up in the middle of the planetarium week. Um, and that was uh, made by a high school student. Um, so that and the drawing, yeah. The drawing. I, I just wanted to mention that Marie Drake is the woman who wrote the lyrics for the Alaska flag song. And is the building correct? is called Rosemary. Yeah. 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 So the building is named after her. So that's why the planet term is named after her. So this was, um, this was one of the smaller, this is probably an average show. This was while the Museum of Flight people were here. Uh, so you could kind of see what it looked like on the dome. They had uh, their projector, which is wasn't as high resolution as the one that we finally got, but it worked really quite well. And everybody was happy. And that was the big thing. Everybody was happy. Uh, we got good publicity in the local newspaper. And fortunately, and fortunately, this came in the middle of the week. So then more people heard about it and we got really busy. Uh, most of the shows were full. Uh, we Some people got turned away because if you didn't sign up, you could show up, and if we had space, we would take you. But uh, the sign up genius worked pretty well for what we needed. Um, so this is some of our statistics. Um, all in all, uh, with the public shows, there were about 682 attendees. Some of those might have been the same people coming for different types of things, like a movie or the live show. And for the elementary school presentations, uh, we had um, over a thousand. 
So it's about 1,700 people or bodies. Again, some of them, a few of them might have been the same bodies. Uh, went Which through. is about 5% of the population of Juno. And uh, someone was asking about the size of the dome. It's 30 feet. So that's a good size. And it's now the second largest in Alaska. So, um, you know, after this, we got somebody who wanted to give a donation of, I think it was $12,000. Wow. Thanks. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, and we also were able to give some time and conversation to the people from Core Alaska, from the Kensington Mine, and they ultimately gave us twenty-five thousand towards the end of the year. So, uh, after the Planetarium Week, we were able to upgrade to and get a Lambda system, but it wasn't the complete. But by the end of 2019, we had received enough to complete the purchase. Um, and so that worked out really well. And so um, we continued to do a few things. This is like the portable again at the State Museum, uh, just to keep, um, keep our name up while we were continuing to raise that final bit of money. But we did get the system. Um, and uh, we're shared facility. The Spitz is still in the middle of the planetarium. So we bought uh, this hydraulic cart for about $1,000, I think, which, which allows us to uh, raise and lower the projector, move the projector safely to a closet when, the, when we're not using the planetarium as a planetarium. And so this is what it looks like when you have it um, sort of in place. Uh, the digitalis system is good in the sense that you can put it off axis and still have it appear as though it's on axis, and that seems to work pretty well. Um, so, oh, so Rosemary, one thing I'd mention, we did have a businessman who gave us $9,000, and nobody's ever really met him or talked to him, so we don't really know what his motivation is. Rosemary talked about, you know, connecting with people emotionally. And sometimes you don't know what triggered that person to give some money from their IRA or, you know, something more than the, you know, $20. We don't know what motivated him. So you never know where a show might touch someone or some media or coverage might tickle someone's fancy. He, um, so That's what I call serendipity. Yes. And we, and we did raise a fair amount in small amounts, right. whether, you know, small could be even up to 500 maybe a thousand in a few this cases one person covered you know almost all of our matching grants so it just worked out well that we were able to get the match right away we right. didn't have to wait for a lot yeah. of smaller donations but we were still advertising the matching grant because it took a while for that money yeah. to actually get confirmed um right. so overall you know just going full force publicity doing something really big um paid a big difference in um the other thing it showed, because it's hard for the community to see the Spitz projector and have any idea as to what it would be like with a digital projector in that dome. But by having the Museum of Flight come in and actually put theirs there, then they could see what they were getting with their donations. And right. so that worked. Um, when I go down south, we go to other planetariums, but not everyone goes and sees other planetariums at work and sees what the technology can do or goes up to Anchorage and sees their planetarium system that's quite sophisticated in the um, Anchorage Museum. It's called the Thomas Planetarium. So I see we're pretty much out of time. I just want to say that we had um, we had a little glitch, so we didn't get to do much training over the holidays because we thought the projector wasn't working, but it was, it was a switch that in the projector that uh, we finally got fixed. And then in 2020, we, before COVID hit, we were able to do some shows with the Perseverance Theaters production of Silent Sky and um, about Miss Levitt stars. Uh, Dave Hansen, one of our board members does astrophotography from Juno, really nice work. He got to display work. some of his while we also gave a talk at the planetarium before one of at the theater before one of the shows um and then um if we had been ready with our digital projector i think we would have had a lot of nice overlap with perseverance theater this is one of the directors of the of perseverance theater she was um 
the creative producer, I think, for the show. So she's the um, artistic director. Artistic it was, director. Um, it was Marion Call who was playing in the, at the uh, one of their events. They have a black box room where they kind of have um, small events relating to the play, any play they have. So I guess what I was going to say is that had we been ready with the digital projector, um, their model is for their fundraisers to come to one of our events for their fundraisers and our fundraisers to perhaps uh, be able to go to some of their shows. But um, we weren't really ready. We hadn't really made the transition to the digital protector fully. So, um, you know, plans for the future. I think what's key for us is connecting with more community groups, at least, and connecting with the education and the school district. That's my interest. And also getting younger volunteers because we're all 50 plus. Um, and so we need some new blood. So I'm going to stop and I'll let- Let me just add, uh, we're also working on our YouTube channel, Marie Drake Planetarium. We're using the OBS and just um, Zoom and side-by-side -side mode with PowerPoint for our shows that we're doing virtually right now. So that's our production. Well, I think uh, you guys see why I was so excited about sharing uh, this group with you guys and um, with everyone um <laughs> very active uh, group and um amazing and thank you so much uh, for for doing this uh, i didn't have to hardly ask any questions i just got started and off you know, so <laughs> excellent um and i really uh, do I hope to come and visit you guys sometime when it's possible to do that hike so bike I ski kayak that's what we do here all right <laughs> I, I just wanted to say okay. hi to Paige because she told me that she'd actually been to the planetarium. <laughs> uh, I think she has a daughter who's lived here or maybe currently lives here. So yeah, my daughter is still there. I, I think I actually though I I went to a program you did at the library or someplace. It wasn't oh. in the dome. So this has been really great. Thanks. Thank you. And my impression is all you guys are volunteers. No oh, yes. Paid. So that's wonderful, too. Yeah, three of us um, are mostly retired. I mean, yeah, that's right. And the two people who aren't here still have day jobs. Um, but we are all volunteers. You don't have to worry about getting laid off. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm a pensioner. <laughs> all right. So thanks for your, if you have, I'll, I'm copying the chat. So if there's something I can respond to you later about that, but I appreciate everyone's just, um, questions and comments. I'll look at those later. Um, and I don't really care how old the volunteer is. I just want, I would like more volunteers. The age is, is immaterial. It's just, it's just, it's just, there's so many things we would like to do. Our, our desire is greater than our, ability and time-wise. It's not, and there's nothing really that we can't do. It's just that it just takes time because you have to learn something from scratch, just like all of you are starting to learn how to do things digitally. You that maybe never did it, never used Zoom before, or never made a, a YouTube video before, or never used OBS before, and suddenly you're having to learn this stuff, um, all the plan terms are. So um, we so want to do as best we can. I'd also like to give a thank you to uh, the community and those people here and all the wonderful events that have happened since COVID happened to help, um, you know, for us, we're just getting into the digital planetarium regime and there's been so much available virtually this year that we would not have been able to uh, attend. Um, so it's just been amazing. We have so much information now that we hope to take probably the next year. We're not sure when the planetarium will open again. I suspect the ventilation is not great. Um, so we have some time to do some planning and feel free to write to us to any ideas if you have. Oh, just, just really quick. I see in the chat, there's a question. Um, yeah, hike, bike, ski, kayak are just the outdoor activities I like doing here. Yes. Right now I'm in the skiing, so Nordic skiing. Yeah. We could all talk all day, but does anyone have any questions? Because I know we're running out of time here. 
Can you put uh, email addresses maybe in the, the chat or someplace? Yeah, why don't you want to go ahead and do that, Rosemary? Just it's. I'll put a couple in here. We we yeah. recently got a G Suite for nonprofits, so we finally have an address with .org, but we're still using one of the other Gmails too. So I'm going to put that. By the way, if you guys could put in um, the uh, the website address, uh, I want to say that they have a wonderful website there with uh, all their history and a whole lot of uh, descriptions of the different shows that they've done all through the years. It's a it's a fantastic website, well worth uh, visiting. So. Yeah, somebody could uh, put that in the chat, or I, don't, I think it'd be easy enough to find too. Marie, I just put uh, all the ones that I that you gave me before. Oh. Uh, Rosemary, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I I put a couple more in there too. Uh, okay. If you want to reach me, you should probably use the Yahoo one because I only occasionally look at the planetary one, but I'm trying to do that more often. Well, this has been great. I think we should have more uh, more seminars like this where we feature <laughs> planetarium. Thanks so much, and everybody on mute, and let's have a round of applause for these for these uh, volunteers. Thank you. Hey, great! Changed my life. <laughs> so we do it because we enjoy it, you know, and it's nice. Thank you for listening to all of this. It's been a bit long perhaps, but um, you can tell we're enthusiastic. We don't have any hard and fast cutoff. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see Steve doing. Uh, put one of the PixPro full dome cameras on his helmet and go out in a kayak and shoot some <laughs> well, well, speaking of which, I would like, I would love to have someone who's an outdoor person maybe be taking 360 pictures and see how those would work on the time term. So this, that's just another idea, but then someone has to find someone, get them in. So, but that's just one of my 50 ideas I could come up with the top of my head. I can send you some, Christina. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, just, but what we're, one thing we're trying to do is we want to have, it's great, it's great to have 360, but we're trying to do things, you know, they call place-based learning. Who wants to hear stuff that relates to their community? So in Alaska, here in Alaska, we're going to talk about the Northern Lights, about Juno, about the Alaska Native culture and history. And that's one of the buzzwords we kind of have now, place-based learning. But also with all our shows, we forgot to say, we'd always start out with the stars tonight and talk about what was happening in Juneau um, at that particular time. And we'd be showing what the night sky would look like if, if the weather was clear. Because a lot of times, it's not a great place for stargazing, as you can imagine. You can get those cameras now for like three, $400 yeah. on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Take it out. It's you know, barely that big hmm. and just hold it up over your head and yeah. and shoot pictures and it and you can run it off your phone. Is there any yeah. particular brand that you like, Jeff? I, I use the, the the PixPro, the Kodak PixPro, but a, again, that's that's for a small room like this. That's not for hmm. a big one. But you hmm. can get, you know, a twenty eight hundred by twenty eight hundred image and that's you know fine. Uh, there are others now out there. That's just what I use. I think that's really um, important. I'm a big fan of getting a 360 camera because then we can take landscapes that are local to here. And so it's really like people see the stars in Juneau. And uh, perhaps we can get the um, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute is the local cultural arm of the Native co Corporation to take a camera around to some of the villages and take some more pictures of various places. But uh, the 360 is just in the dome. It's just amazing. What you want is a, it's a fisheye. So it's not yeah. just the camera that shoots around like this. You need the fisheye so that it will right. the dome. So that's the thing. To and I, I've talked recently to Dave Cuomo at Digitalis about la layers trying to get uh, more imagery and uh, textures, higher data resolution for Southeast Alaska. So that, uh, you know, when you have that, when you go into the earth and fly into Juno, you don't see a glacier that is uh, an image from 20 years ago when the location was a lot different. <laughs> you can actually uh, get something that's more relevant to people here. 
Yeah, I've been here 23 years and it's amazing how much the Mendenhall Glacier, which is a mile from my house, has receded in this time. I, I mean, it used to be I'd have to drag my kayak over the moraine to get to the glacier face, but now I can kayak right up to the glacier face. And, and the ice cave is dynamic. The ice cave changes every season. So uh, in the icebergs that calve, there's less calving from the Mendenhall Glacier now because it's receded from the deep part. It's going up on the rock cliff. So maybe um, my lifetime, uh, the glacier will recede from the lake. Sounds like you could have a planetarium show about climate change in Alaska. Yeah. yeah, that's another one of our many topics. You have a really mandate for that, actually. Climate change. Mm. And they covered that a lot in the last Astronomical Society conference. Yeah, yeah the last Astron Astronomical Society the Pacific conference was really very good, um, focusing on, Alaska, on astronomy education and public community events. And they had a lot of effort there on climate change with the planetariums getting more involved in that. That could be a topic I can give you a person, I can give a suggest a speaker, the guy at University of Alaska Anchorage, uh, Travis Rector. He would be really good to talk about that. Yeah. And the organization Astronomers for Planet Earth, I think that's free to join and they're really gonna be very busy with, they're gonna really try to put a lot of resources together so you don't have to be searching out on your own time. And the other project we want to do is we have uh, two science on the sphere here. And one of them is just a, uh, you know half a mile from the planet chairman at State Museum. So when we use these science on the sphere data sets, not only can we use them in the planetarium, but if we could find someone to volunteer, they could go over to the museum and um, get someone and do some shows there. Because I don't think they even have a, they don't have a, a particularly specialized person to work on that at the museum because they have other things to show. But they do have a nice room with that, that option. And that conference was also very good, the Science on the Sphere conference, that is free. Um, put out on by NOAA. It just happened. I just put in the chat an image for you that you can look at that I took in a, a, a square in, in Prague after the IPS conference, just handheld. Hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, we'll all, get, yeah. We'll all be getting nostalgic about traveling though, Jack. <laughs> I know, but it's, well, I was looking for an example and I found yeah, that. Yeah, thanks. Well, that, that takes a minute to uh, download. So we're gonna, it will. I, I had to, I had to run off to, cause I, I, I got a notice on my machine. I had 9% battery left. So I had to run off and get my uh, charger in. <laughs> I didn't want a recording to stop. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it running so that we can get the download of that cathedral uh, um, picture. Ooh, okay. Whoever wants to download it, you just click it on. Click I'm on just it. downloading it. Yeah. Yeah, it's on my desktop. I, I got it. Yeah, okay, good. Well. So it's sunset here in 45 minutes. So I was, I was gonna go outside before it gets dark. <laughs> and we're not gonna see uh, any sky tonight. It's still cloudy. In fact, the last two weeks, I've only seen Jupiter and Saturn once, just briefly, in the southwest. Because they're setting around 6 p.m. now. Show of hands <laughs> who's uh, been watching Jupiter and Saturn, or has been able to. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. They are getting close, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, uh, one day, we put our a, a nice telescope on the dock by the uh, cruise ships, and we were looking for the, uh, was it Saturn? Something was happening with Saturn. Well, we that was the transit. Had, that, you that had it out all like for eight hours we were there. And everyone was stopping by, <laughs> and not once did we get to see it. It was cloudy. <laughs> we raised some money, but we didn't do anything because it, it, it never appeared. But that, that's another fun event, um, just doing all kinds of crazy things. You, you, you do not move to Juno for stargazing. It's definitely not a good place for stargazing at all. Because I used to live in San Diego and Medford, Oregon, and Bozeman. They were good for stargazing, but not here. Yeah, it's been raining pretty much nonstop over yeah. here. I'm just outside of Tacoma, so <laughs> definitely haven't seen anything. Carl, uh, before before we finish, I want to thank you, Carl, for 
arranging this, you know, for making the connection and, and, uh, and playing. I think it's a, a very good idea to have this kind of visit to a planetarium. Oh, Thank you, Carl. Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. It was easy. You guys had, did all the work there. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I, it was I want great. your picture with your hats. I can put it on my uh, <laughs> website. <laughs> had to put that back on here. Has yeah. no, has nothing to do with education, but it's fun, you know. <laughs> Why not? No Thank fun. you, Carl. Looking good. All right. <laughs> My uh, Santa in Space video will be up sh shortly. I just have to finish it. I know it's a, uh, I like to do things very quickly. That's what the, all the fundraising and other stuff we've done is just teamwork. <laughs> hey, one of the questions I had for you guys, maybe somebody can answer it quickly, is how did you ever meet each other? Because there's five of you that are involved with this and all of you are very heavily involved doing a lot of stuff. And how, how did you get together? Did you know each other from previously? No, just convergence at the planetarium. Wow. So Rosemary, how did you get involved, right. Rosemary? Uh, well, when I moved to Juneau in 2003, I started teaching some at the university. Um, the intro astronomy, um, conceptual yeah. physics, and a little bit of math. And um, so I knew of the planetarium. And I even took students there a few times. But I think Michael Orlov, again, was kind of key to keeping it going, him with um, John Kramer and a few others and Steve. And so by the time I joined the planetarium, um, I wasn't teaching except as an adjunct. And, um, you know, I was very much aware of what, what was possible and what they were doing. So it, it, I think if people know about the planetarium, it collects certain people and we've had more volunteers in the past but eventually people kind of come in and move out of Juno so it changes quite a bit and uh Dave Hansen um but Juno is so small because wrote J Dave Hansen one of our volunteers has this job that Steve used to have when he was working yeah no fishery and, um Rosemary and Steve both teach at the same class at the university, and I'm married to Steve, so everyone's all connected. So you can never go to an event and say, oh boy, that play really was terrible because the person who wrote it or who was in it or their relative was in it is probably behind you. So it's a, you can't really have an affair here in Juno. <laughs> or you go to Seattle and do it, but then you'd probably meet all these people and say, what are you doing here at the airport? So You do tend to meet Juno people at the Seattle airport. Right, yeah. So, anyway, so everyone's kind of, it goes back to this thing of everyone being connected. Like, I went to my doctor's appointment yesterday. Someone was wearing a mask with moons on it. So I got talking to them, and it turns out their daughter is an astronomer. So I gave them my email and everything. I said, why don't your daughter give a talk about what she does as a Zoom interview? And who knows, it may happen. You know, I have no, I, I'll ask people, and sometimes these things pan out, you know.